Perfect. So uh, my name is Mani Moyuddin. I'm probably the most junior myeloma doctor here. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to be here and um, perfect. All right. So, okay, perfect. Can you, can you all hear me better? Okay, perfect. So um, I finished fellowship last year. So for the last year and a half, I've been uh, focusing on multiple myeloma and other plasma cell disorders. Um, I've had the fortune of working with Health Tree Cure Hub on, on some projects. I'll briefly touch upon them. The topic that I'm going to talk about today is maintenance in myeloma. And um, I'm going to sort of go over the history of maintenance, the landscape of maintenance today, and how maintenance trials um, look like in the future. And then I'm also going to use those trials as examples of some of the, the issues that we face in myeloma on trials, control arms, endpoints, and you know, what's the best solution moving forward. Um, and also about individualizing care, which is you know, something that you know, for most of how we've treated myeloma, it's been a one-size-fits-all approach, and how that may not be the best way to treat myeloma for everybody. All right, so we'll jump in. Um, so rational history, what do we use, side effects, how long should maintenance be, and, and future directions. So, you know, we've been trying maintenance uh, in myeloma for a long, long time. And this goes back from where, you know, we didn't have a lot of good options. So we tried prednisone, we tried interferon, we tried thalidomide. And the thing about these trials is that these drugs were toxic, they impaired quality of life, and they never convincingly led people to, to live longer, right? Ultimately, when we're doing maintenance, right? So we do maintenance after we've done some sort of intensive induction therapy for uh, you know, three to four months, and then you've done a transplant, and then you've recovered from the transplant, and now we're doing something to try to keep the disease under control, right? So we're subjecting you all to additional therapy, and it should be worth it, right? You're still having to take a pill after having gone through transplant and induction. It should be worth it. It should help you live longer, right? So these old agents did not lead to improved longevity, and they were toxic. So these trials didn't really work out. Revlimid maintenance, however, did work out. So there have been multiple large randomized trials where the use of Revlimid not only prolonged the remission, but it helped people live longer. And we're talking in excess of two years um, on average if you sort of pool the analysis of those trials. Now, some of those trials had less of an OS, less of a survival benefit, some had more. But if you pool the data, at least from that era, it is very convincing that Revlimid maintenance compared to no maintenance, and you can sort of see that in the in the blue graph versus the, the yellow graph. You know, the blue graph is doing a whole lot better. And um, this sort of was the backbone that established maintenance therapy in principle. Meaning, and, and you know, this was from a time where the induction therapies that we used were a little different, right? So these trials are now, you know, over a decade old. So at that time, the induction therapy was not what you know, our patients are getting today. So today our patients are getting three drugs or four drugs. A lot of the induction therapy used at this time was two drugs, sometimes three drugs. And a lot of people had residual disease, right? The, they didn't, the disease wasn't cleared by these two or sometimes three drug regimens. And so maintenance therapy was better than not doing anything after some residual disease was left behind. So the induction therapy doesn't really compare to today's standards, um, and hence, you know, the question of how much benefit maintenance adds with today's modern therapy for people who've had really, really good responses already with, you know, induction and transplant is an open one, and I think it, it should be investigated. Then the question comes, and, you know, there's almost a cultural divide on how much Revlimid is enough, right? Like Revlimid for two years, or Revlimid for one year, or Revlimid lifelong. And I think uh, across the ocean in Europe, generally, you know, there's more of a finite use of Revlimid, whereas in the US, we tend to give Revlimid until either progression or until there's some intolerance and patients can't take Revlimid anymore. Now, do we have strong data that sort of backs this? And I would say that there is a randomized trial that's completed enrollment and, you know, we'll, we'll have answers. But our data is sort of based on you know, weak data, I would argue. So if you look at this trial, 
and you know this is a trial in which you know we we're, we're comparing people who continued Revlimid versus people who stopped Revlimid. People weren't randomized to either continue Revlimid or stop Revlimid. We're sort of looking back and seeing those who continued versus those who stopped. It sure seems that those who continued seem to have a have prolonged uh, PFS or their disease stayed in remission for longer. Now we always take these sort of analyses with a grain of salt, right? Because the people who are able to continue treatment usually have different characteristics, biological features, uh, socioeconomic status compared to those who don't. Um, so this was a follow-up of a randomized trial, but this wasn't the actual randomization, but it's the best we have. So a lot of us, um, you know, if somebody's tolerating Revlimid really well, otherwise they're not having issues, it's not affecting their quality of life, at least in the United States, a lot of us tend to continue Revlimid. The question of, you know, should, can you stop early for those who respond really well is an open one, which I'll sort of talk about a little in, in a little bit. So we've had an explosion of new drugs in myeloma, right? And a lot of these drugs, as you all know, or as you all might know, the you know new drugs are, are first studied in the relapse refractory space, right? For patients who've had multiple relapses, that's where these drugs first get studied. And then they get brought forward. And then you know maintenance is one place where we can look at as well and see if you know if you could, if adding something to Revlimid helps. So we do have data from two randomized trials that adding carfilzomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, a newer version of Velcade, established drug for relapse refractory myeloma. We have two trials that tell us whether adding carfilzomib to Revlimid is that better than Revlimid alone as maintenance. And it sure seems. Um, that, you know, if you look at the progression-free survival for standard risk patients, you can see a clear difference here. So let me make sure I can get this right. How do you press the light button on this? Is it? Oh, there we go. Sorry, forgive my uh, ignorance with this. Oops. Okay. So you can see for standard risk patients, you know, the blue line. So progression-free survival, meaning the disease staying in remission, is definitely better for standard risk patients with KR versus R. Now, I kind of want to um, you know, I'm going to like expand upon that a little bit. High risk patients. So this is, you know, I'm sure you guys heard earlier today about high risk myeloma, where often the problem with high risk myeloma is not getting them in remission; it's keeping them in remission, right? So it makes sense to try to do more for maintenance to sort of keep them in remission because your initial therapy might get the numbers better, but they tend to relapse quicker. So for high risk disease, the onus is to keep the progression to keep the progression-free survival going, help keep them in remission. And in the past, so even if you look at the Revlimid data that I showed you, if you isolated the patients with high-risk disease, they didn't seem to benefit a whole lot from Revlimid. They benefited less compared to you know, those with standard risk. So we all have been very excited about, finally, we have data that for patients with high risk, and this is you know, cytogenetic, so the DNA of the cancer has those high-risk features, so those patients seem to do better with carfilzomib versus Revlimid. Double hit means they have two or more of those DNA high-risk features, and they also seem to do better. Based on this and some older data, for high-risk disease, we do tend to prefer doublet maintenance, so using two drug maintenance strategies. We don't have comparative data that tells us that carfilzomib is better than Velcade in this situation, but Velcade hasn't been studied in such a robust fashion. Nevertheless, I think if you, you, know, if you ask around, you know, based on our cumulative interpretation of the data, it sure seems that Revlimid and a proteasome inhibitor is what we prefer for high-risk disease. Now, now, carfilzomib comes at a cost, right? Literally and metaphorically. So instead of taking just a pill, you are now coming in and getting an infusion. In one of the trials, this infusion was given twice a week. And there are lots of people that dropped out, right? That action speak louder than words. There's also dosing schedules where it's given once a week. There are dosing schedules where it's given once every other week, which is obviously a lot more palatable than having to come in every week for years. So you know, the PFS benefit, we still don't know whether people live longer, but the remission seems to be a little longer with carfilzomib. The PFS benefit for standard risk is, for most of us, it's not enough to convince us that we need to start adopting carfilzomib for every patient, right? You obviously have that conversation. It's not really approved, um, it would be, but it's something to think about. For high risk, 
you know, most of us would think that it's worth it because these are the patients who tend to relapse a little quicker, so it makes sense to do more, and it might be worth the inconvenience, but these are all feel, uh, questions that our, our field is grappling with. What about daratumumab? So you probably have heard a lot about daratumumab earlier today. Uh, it's a CD38 monoclonal antibody, has revolutionized the treatment, and it's a lot safer than some of the other drugs we have. So we don't really have solid data for you know, the type of induction therapy we use in the US, VRD, or, um, and, 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 and what daratumumab by itself adds. We do have trials that are looking at daratumumab and revlimid versus revlimid alone. But at least based on European data, so where velcate thalidomide and dexamethasone was used, if you look, so basically if you, you know, the simple way to look at this curve is that these three lines are doing similarly, right? We can get into the, the weeds of it, but these three lines are doing sep, uh, uh, similarly, and this line isn't. So the red line is not something that happens in the US. This is people who got velcate thalidomide and dex, got a transplant and then got nothing afterwards. So there's no revlimid. All right, so it may not apply to you, but we know that these people do a lot worse than other things. If you look at these three things, whether people got daratumumab as induction, meaning they got it for the first four cycles, as you know, with VR, VTD, or whether they got it later after transplant as maintenance, it sure seems that you know, they're, they, they sort of caught up, right? So it's very hard to apply this to today's patients in the United States. And some would argue that if you get daratumumab uh, in induction, like if you're getting, you know, dara VRD, like we really don't know how much additional benefit, to, you know, a few years of daratumumab maintenance would add. It's an open question, which is open for debate. But you definitely don't want to be like without any treatment whatsoever. That you know, you don't want to be on the red line. That's sort of what this graph tells you. Now, I know that people have different opinions about this, but in my opinion, you probably heard about the Griffin trial, right, which was daratumumab VRD versus VRD for newly diagnosed myeloma. For maintenance, the people who were previously randomized to daratumumab continue to get daratumumab, and the patients who were randomized to VRD got Revlimid. So in a design like that, you can't really, in my opinion, tell the difference between daratumumab as induction and daratumumab as maintenance. So even though you're seeing better outcomes with dara RVD and RVD, um, and dara RVD is getting dara and Revlimid maintenance, it's hard to know how much of this difference is because of the use of daratumumab in induction versus the use of daratumumab in maintenance. So again, sort of an open question for the field. We do have some trials that are combining daratumumab and Revlimid. And so we have one trial that's um, a trial that sort of is comparing DARA plus Revlimid and Revlimid. These are for people who are MRD positive. So there's some measurable residual disease left behind after induction and transplant. And they're looking and seeing if adding daratumumab helps in the conversion rate of MRD, okay? Do people after one year of therapy, people that were MRD positive become MRD negative? One would hope that with additional effective therapy, you sort of see that. This other trial, and this is a big trial, it's 1,100 patients, a big cooperative group trial, is comparing DARA and Revlimid to Revlimid. Um, and this is actually powered for overall survival. So it will take a long time to get the answer, but this will answer the question, is it better to give DARA to map earlier as maintenance, or just wait and like give it a little later? Like, is it worth subjecting patients to come in for infusions, increase risk of infection, et cetera? Um, so this will answer, but it will take a long time and the field is moving fast. The, but the other interesting thing is that this trial, the one thing we're all really excited about is that after two years, if you're MRD negative, meaning that in your bone marrow, we're unable to detect any disease, there's a randomization where you can either stop treatment or continue treatment. So this, in a prospective controlled fashion, will tell us whether it's safe and effective to discontinue treatment completely for people who after two years of maintenance are in a really, really deep remission with no residual disease. So we're really excited about this. And we face these decisions today in clinic and we, you know, we sometimes base it on our patient's values and preferences and sometimes we base it on weak data and we do sometimes take people off treatment, but this will answer it in a comprehensive fashion. We're also looking and seeing whether for those who are MRD positive, whether escalating treatment helps. I sort of showed you the design for the daratumumab study. There's also a cooperative group study looking at exasimib, and this is actually testing survival. So whether escalating treatment for those who are MRD positive, doing more than just Revlimid for maintenance, whether that helps people live longer. Again, it will take a long time, but this is an important question. 
Now, some food for thought, all right? This is gonna be a little controversial, not too much, but just a little bit. All right, so this is work that we did with Health Tree Cure Hub, and we asked patients what they think a cure is, okay? So this is, these results are what you all think, what 1,500 patients think. Okay, so five um, is the, the blue color, okay? So obviously, you know, the ideal version of a cure is you permanently stop treatment and you have no evidence of disease. Most people consider that a cure, okay? What about people who are on Revlimid maintenance long-term and they may not have any evidence of disease? Well, you all seem to think that that is not a cure. So continuing to take a same pill or injection, even if it has minimal toxicity and no evidence of disease, most of you don't think that's a cure. And um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you all seem to account for toxicity in your definition of a cure. And we as physicians are sometimes short-sighted, right? We're sort of focused on, um, you know, presence or absence of disease. But as a patient, there are a lot more things that you all think about. And this is, this is a lot of food for thought for us. And it sort of, you know, should incentivize us to design trials where we try to take people off treatment as soon and as safe as possible without jeopardizing disease control. Because you all are telling us that if you stay on treatment, you don't think it's secure. So we already know that carfilzomib and revlimid has a better PFS than revlimid. We, have, we know that based on two trials. I showed you one of them, the Forte trial. So I'm sort of gonna give you some food for thought that we have all of these new drugs in myeloma. Do we need to combine all of them with revlimid and show that each of them has a better progression-free survival than revlimid? I would argue that's not the best use of our patients' resources. And then the other thing with trials like that is that if you have high risk disease, I wouldn't want to put you on Revlimid. So if there's a Revlimid versus Revlimid plus something else, like, you know, we already know that PFS is better with carfilzomib and that high risk patients shouldn't get Revlimid. So that's one thing that I really struggle with when it comes to maintenance trials. And this stuff is complicated, right? Like you have to have a trial that appeases regulatory authorities and you have to, you know, and, you know so there's like teclistimab and Revlimid versus Revlimid alone. So, the problem is that if somebody has high risk disease, those are the people who benefit the most from Revlimid, but I wouldn't love putting them on a control arm of Revlimid if they have high risk disease. There's also a trial in Australia, Selinexa and Revlimid versus Revlimid, right? We already know that Revlimid plus Carfilzomib is better for those who we really prioritize a better PFS. So these trials, do they answer questions of true strategic value? That's something that I really struggle with. And then, does every drug need to be studied in maintenance? Again, that's something that I struggle with as well. You know, belantamab has a role in heavily relapsed disease, but belantamab comes with side effects, eye side effects, and need to see an ophthalmologist. So I would feel troubled putting somebody on belantamab in maintenance when I could just put them on Revlimid. And I don't know whether, you know, in a single arm trial, I won't know whether belantamab's better. So I wouldn't want to put my patients through ocular exams and all of those things. Even if we find the right dose, like, is it really gonna challenge some of the other drugs that we have already established in maintenance? So just, I don't think that maintenance, like I don't think that every new drug should be studied in maintenance. Some drugs are better suited for maintenance than others. You know, if it's oral, if it has less side effects, those are the drugs that are probably best suited. But again, this is something that I sort of struggle with. So the, the landscape of maintenance trials is emblematic of a lot of the struggles we face in clinical research for myeloma, right? Like, what should the endpoint be? If you study overall survival, it takes a really, really long time, right? But if you're studying surrogates, like progression-free survival or measurable residual disease negativity, you should give the best treatment, right? Like, you know that you can get better PFS with something more than Revlimid, so I don't know, I, I don't love the fact that there's Revlimid and then the endpoint's PFS. Control arms, this is a tough thing, right? In many areas of the world, um, you know, even Revlimid is hard to get by. So if you design a global trial, it is tough to have a control arm that is applicable and that suits everybody. And then I guess, you know, I am a firm advocate for randomized control trials and Dr. Sporov earlier today, you know, articulated very nicely about the importance of randomized control trials. But are some trials even necessary at all? Do we need to expend a thousand patients just to prove that some drug is better than, in maintenance than Revlimid alone, when we already know that you know, two is better than one for PFS in, in, in maintenance? So these are things that I really struggle with, and the answers of this are really complicated and you know, worthy of a full discussion. 
And then just some food for thought, we're getting close to a cure for myeloma um, in developed countries, but we are leaving a lot of the world behind. So we, I, we studied this where we looked at trials that led to approval in the US. So we looked at where those trials enrolled, and we found out that they enroll in a variety of countries. So they enroll in some high income countries, upper middle income countries, and some lower middle income countries. But it's only in those rich blue countries that those drugs actually end up getting approved later. Even though these, you know, these orange and green countries, they contributed their patients to those trials, the drug didn't really get approved. So we are, that's a lot of food for thought. And there's so many inequities in global inequity. There's obviously racial disparities, but there's global inequities that, that haunt me in, 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 in our landscape of, of clinical trials. Um, and then one last thing. So I'm, as you probably guessed, I'm very passionate about you know, advocating for better trials and better control arms and better endpoints. And we can make a difference. So you know, we've, we've published work about this. And there was a three drug versus two drug trial that was announced um, back in, I believe that was back in ASH 2020. And we basically you know, advocated. We're like, it's not OK to do a three versus two drug tri trial anymore. So after a lot of pressure, some scientific papers, they actually change their control arm. So we can do better. And if you know where my advocacy comes from is a desire to have more meaningful trials and trials that actually you know, answer meaningful questions and don't hurt the patients in the control arms. Most trials are good, but there's always room for improvement. So with that, um, I thank you all for listening, and I'd love to answer any questions you all might have. Yeah.